So welcome everyone. Uh, this is a talk from the University of Oklahoma Libraries on a pilot we're running on leveraging the national research platform to build a scalable research and education environment. My name's Tyler Pearson. I'm the Director of Informatics at the library. And my colleague... I'm Mark Loverswire. I'm the Research Data Specialist. So I want to take a, a quick moment just to uh, recognize the National Research Platform and their partners, along with the Great Plains Network and their former Executive Director, James Deaton. Now, without them, we wouldn't be doing this presentation today. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the National Research Platform, uh, it is a partnership of more than 50 institutions led by the researchers at UC San Diego, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and UC Berkeley, and includes the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, and multiple research universities in the US and around the world. And additionally, the Great Plains Network is a nonprofit consortium advocating research on behalf of universities and community innovators across the Midwest and the Great Plains who seek collaboration, cyber infrastructure, and support for big data and big ideas. So the, the Nautilus project kicked off right around I believe it was 2015, and to date they've had uh, over six grants uh, totaling over $27 million. Uh, from a technical perspective, Nautilus is a hypercluster for running containerized applications utilizing Kubernetes for managing and scaling applications. Uh, the partners also provide the hardware uh, behind uh, what's running uh, Kubernetes. Additionally, a benefit of Nautilus that we've utilized is their community. Uh, their shared resources, both uh, in uh, compute resources, but also documentation that's available uh, through GitLab. Uh, there's an online chat that we've utilized quite a bit, both providing feedback to the National Research Platform, but also to troubleshoot when we run into problems. Uh, additionally, there's a lot of workshops uh, that, are, that are held for building some of those skill sets. So for those of you that are not familiar with Kubernetes, it's an open source system originally developed by Google for um, orchestrating the life cycle of containerized applications. And one of the things, well, let me go back. So, I want to emphasize that we are not experts in Kubernetes. We are just users of this platform. And the National Research Platform and their system administrators uh, make it uh, much more easier for us to deploy on. And, and we uh, approach this uh, from a perspective of being users. And specifically for our pilot, uh, we've deployed a Jupyter Hub instance. And uh, another great thing about the community is there is a configuration where we only had to write uh, just uh, under a couple hundred lines of configuration as opposed to a thousand uh, or multiple thousands of, of lines of YAML uh, if we were to want to deploy this ourselves. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague to talk a little bit more about why, uh, what led us up to uh, pursuing uh, using Jupyter Hub uh, within Nautilus. So for us here at the University Libraries, we offer a lot of workshops as for researcher tools around the, the things that will make things like data management, uh, better practices around code development, and those uh, elements um, much easier. The problem is, is that a lot of these software need to be installed locally. And depending upon um, the type of machine and how that machine's being managed, not all faculty have root administration rights, or they have to go through a software process to get their software approved. Um, also, we run into the fact that um, there is issues around the um, variety of types of hardware, right? Faculty are famous for driving their computers till the last bit of magic smoke comes out. So we have various ages of equipment. They also, one of the research complaints had been a lack of a common coding environment. So when a new graduate student comes in, they load the current version of Python and all the supportive libraries. Then two years later, a new graduate student comes in, comes in with a new machine. They get all the latest stuff. In the meantime, 
the old machine may not necessarily have been keeping up with their patches and updates. And so what you start to see is this coding environment in a research group that might have the most recent version of Python, but be two versions behind in their specific libraries. And so now the question around reproducibility starts to come in and have a big play because suddenly code that runs on a machine that's running a library that's two versions behind, and now that same software doesn't run on a current version, right? They've, turns out they've deprecated a command. These become an issue for us, and faculty then are starting to lose time. So one of the things, as we pointed out, we're at varying user environments, um, various policies, inconsistence of versioning, um, conflicting software. Not all the software, when it comes onto a machine, will work with that particular version of the OS, or it may require additional packages that will affect the OS. These are all things that faculty do not want to have to be thinking about when they're doing their research, and especially for any faculty that are also wanting to teach these technology tools in a classroom environment. It runs into a huge waste of time, and this, this, this common framework that we're going to be offering up and discussing in a second addresses those issues. And of course, the whole reproducibility challenges around research that's starting to become more and more important can be addressed with this. Hardware, especially in the student environment as learners, they're going to come in with instruments that aren't going to necessarily allow for the ins installation of some of these tools. Legacy laptops, um, you know, hey, you know, older brother just graduated, guess who got the hand-me-down machine that's now four years old? So that type of uh, instance. Um, recent architecture change around Spark, uh, the uh, ARM chip. Um, with Apple, and then with researchers working with various types of GPUs as AI machine learning starts to become more prevalent in a lot of research domains, there are a lot of choices around GPU cards, and so this, this method will also allow for us to take care of some of that. Um, what we did was we started working um, with an initial installation, and as, as Tyler alluded, we did not have to be Kubernetes experts. In fact, we didn't even have to be JupyterHub experts. Um, we built upon the community. We took examples of running infrastructures that were already out there. These are all shared environments. We tailored it to our particular needs and working with our central IT group in terms of supporting um, resources such as a DNS and, and everything else. And, and within um, two months, we had a, a working piloting type of, of uh, operation to go. We presented at our local academic tech expo in that January, and we got an interested faculty member who wanted to use it for teaching. We then since expanded out to a full semester's worth of a class in, in a learning mode, as well as working with one or two researchers on research projects. We finally decided that we needed to do metrics, and that's something that this system is not necessarily designed to do, so we had to kind of learn to do that, and, and, and we were more than willing to share that. And now we're in the end of our first year, moving into our second year, so we'd like to discuss a little bit of the speed bumps and, and how we're going to move forward with the next phase of this project. So the project timeline in specifics to show you just how fast we got this up and running from our resources, it was December of 2021 that we started working with this. We presented at the end of January um, the expo. By February, we had a faculty member wanting us to run for a meteorology course for upperclassmen. It was a professional meteorology course that had a, a segment on programming, and he wanted to use this for their programming session. We then offered our first workshop, which was our primary goal, was to facilitate working with workshops. We teach software carpentry and data carpentry, which has in software installed. And we went, what we would find is that that initial hour of the workshop where we ended up having to solve that issue of everyone's install went away. Our biggest problem was getting people logged onto the system. And that, and that was you know, trivial in terms of time and effort on that. We then expanded the test with an REU, Research Experience for Undergrads. And this is a program where students from around the country come into the country. They are paired with a mentor. In this case, it was meteorology. They work with a meteorologist uh, for 10 weeks on a small-scale research project, learning about research as undergrads to decide if they want to go on and do a career in graduate studies. Um, this platform, because it does offer persistent storage and continuation, it's not like some of the things that you would maybe pay money to fire up into the cloud and have it go run, but then at the end of the workshop you have to set it down. These things can continue to run. And so we did have undergraduates who continued working with their mentors and who then presented at the American Meteorological Student Conference in the annual meeting. So the work continues, but what this did, it was it gave the researcher a common framework so that they were working on the same versions 
of the Python with the meteorological software, with their data. They could share code back and forth and have this common framework so that they didn't have to worry about if the student had resources once they got back to their home institution. The faculty member didn't have to worry about that they might be too far advanced in terms of um, versions of code, and that went very, very well. We then expanded to our first full semester under just a single class. It was an introductory programming course in meteorology, and then um, that was very well, it went very well to where we expanded it the next semester for that same course to both sections. So we went from about 20 users in a learning environment to almost 50 users in our learning environment, and that's where we stand today in terms of our pilot and who's been working with this along with some of our researchers. Um, I don't know how big this is showing up, but this is our initial login to the Jupyter. So this was based on a federated login called CI login. That's another advantage because as a faculty member teaching a course, you don't have to create new accounts on the system. If the student has a valid student ID, it authenticates off the federated login of CI login. And what they'll have is their choice of these pods or containers. These are Docker containers that are basically designed to bring in a working environment. We know a little bit about Docker containers, but that's one of the services as a library we can offer our researchers or our instructors is that we can help them create these if they wish to know them, or they can use the ones that we set up. We just need to know what their software requirements are for their particular course so we can build them in. So um, we have kind of a generic science one in SciPy. That's the standard Python install with most of the libraries. Meteorology, as I mentioned, has some very specific libraries associated with weather, and so we put those in into its own container, and so that is allowed to run. We've got one for Constellate. That was our research project. We had a faculty member who was doing research on text analysis, and so one of the things that we did was we made sure that this Python version had all the natural language toolkit tools in addition to a library that was been created by JSTOR called Constellate that also facilitates, and they have a very nice um, tutorial section so that if a faculty member is wanting to learn more about natural language, we, can, we have it so that those, those workbooks are in. Um, then we have one for Tensor um, AI um, machine learning that works with the TensorFlow, um, and then we've got the R in R Studio. So not only does this run um, a, a standard notebook stack that you'd expect in Python or, or Jupyter, it also can run applications. And we have a pod that will run either an R as a notebook or R Studio as a, a, an integrated developer environment that's pretty typical for, for our users. And then we have the, the kitchen sink one for data science just to show that it can be done where it has all the programming languages that are typically used. And that's a big container and takes a little while to, to run on that. From where they select the container that they want, they are given the, the typical Jupyter. This is the one for R and RStudio. You can see along the top, they can, they can instigate or start a session using RStudio or R. They can also um, access the console of those tools along with um, some editors and then the terminal or the command line. And as much as students um, may not like that, there are still certain practices and research such as version control that work very, very well in the command line interface so we have that ability to connect a terminal window to any of these sessions that, that they fire up. This is an example then that of an RStudio um, lesson that was brought up where you've got the R code in the typical code window. You have a figures plot window. You have access to the file system. So any of you who are familiar with working with RStudio, this is a typical RStudio deployment. This is an application that's running the R framework. And the other nice thing, we talked about the common framework, is that all the libraries that are available in the R Studio are the same libraries that are available in the R Notebook, right? So everything is same as they work through this. This is an example of another application where we can run OpenRefine as an application. So OpenRefine is a great tool for cleaning data and, 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 and working out of that. It's, um, a standalone application that actually presents through the browser when you run it locally, but here it's also presenting through the browser, but it's just being managed on, a, on this Jupyter um, cluster that we're running on this. Here's a typical meteorology. So we talk about meteorology. This particular library has the ability to do the graphics and visualizations that meteorologists are used to using. This is a four-panel, multi-level, multi-variable um, type of state. I can tell you this will help with forecasting. I'm a meteorologist by training, so this is great that I'm able to do this all with the bringing in of a one, one library and gives me the access and control to be able to work with these. This is an example of, a, of a, one of the things that we think is an advantage to this is that especially with, we have a very active open educational resource 
community within our university. But one of the things that you find a lot of times is that while you can bring together a lot of text to create for a great classroom, there is not much in the way of homework problem sets or tutorials. This is an example of a tutorial that I built to showcase the idea. This was a blog on, on R, using R for linear regression and whether or not it's a single variable or multivariant type of model. And so the, the layout is such that it's a standalone with hyperlinks going out to additional resources with snippets of code that then hi highlight the topic that they're trying to do. The example on the right is to, to do, is, is my data following the assumptions that are needed? And this is showing them doing a histogram um, fit of the data to show that you've got kind of this bi bimodal or modal, single mode, whether or not it's going to be multivariant or not. So this is an example of some of the metrics that we started gathering. And uh, we, we put together um, some tooling right around November of last year and, and started capturing active sessions. And uh, we can see as this progresses um, through the semester, the, the, um, the, the lines on the left are that first initial meteorology class. And we could see that uh, at the peak, uh, we had 25 active sessions. And uh, as we uh, went through the winter break, uh, the next set of peaks there uh, is actually a software carpentry. Uh, session that we had. And then um, we added the additional uh, meteorology classes, and this auto-scaled for us. Once we had deployed this, we didn't have to do anything extra to add these additional users on. Um, I will say that we, we, for our instance, we aren't limiting those who can log in, but the configurations are there that we could uh, enforce that um, only those approved users are on here, but um, since we've opened this up, our max usage uh, prior to this conference, we had 38 active uh, users uh, using this, and we can see this slight upward uh, trend in, uh, in our usage. So since we started uh, grabbing our metrics, we've had over 2,500 unique sessions by uh, 335 users and on average, so the median session length for each of these sessions is just under two hours. And uh, we can see uh, in this table here uh, what our, our popular um, pods are, our Docker containers. And it makes sense, we've, we've onboarded uh, three meteorology classes that uh, this would be our most popular um, pod. Um, and these others are probably tied into our software carpentry, uh, especially the RStudio, uh, the SciPy, which, which houses our, our Python environment. Um, so just prior to here, this workshop, I was a guest lecturer for one of those meteor for both meteorology sections. I was teaching Git and GitHub as part of the version control. This just shows you one of the monitoring tools that we can see all the login sessions that are occurring. You can see mine, I didn't fuzz out for you. Um, but of this, um, all but about three or four of the connections were students in the class, and you can see the utilization that was going on at this time. One of the things I did not mention, but that is also makes this really important is the fact that the storage that is assigned to your login that's associated with the login is what we call persistent storage. So it stays there. A lot of times when you're dealing with systems like this in the cloud, you get storage for the time that the cloud is active, but then as soon as you log off, you lose all access to that. This storage stays and is attached to the next time you log in with that username. And we do have the capability to grow that. We limit it right now to about five gig gigabytes because we want to be good community people. We don't want to be carving out a ton of storage that we may or may not be using. But it also gives us an opportunity to talk to the students about what makes for good file management on computing systems. Um, I don't know if you've ever worked with students and you ask, well, let's go to your project folder and you go right to the downloads directory on their laptop. And in the downloads directory, you see eight downloads of the same data set, right? So it gives you an opportunity as an instructor to start bringing in good data management practices and things like that. The key point is, is that the students will have access. 
What we're really excited to do about this is to follow this cohort as it starts to migrate through the meteorology program. This is an introductory course for fre uh, late freshmen, early sophomores. This account will be available to them through their entire career through our program. So when they run into programming exercises or classes that will require them to do programming, they will still have this environment. So anything that they built in previous classes can then still be available to them within this information system um, through, the, through the Kubernetes. This just is to show the various institutions. We've not totally locked down our access because we've been wanting to promote it, but also because of the fact that our REU student program are coming from other universities. And this is just some of the major ones, but if you're anything into meteorology, you know that Wichita State, Valpo for Valparaiso, um, um, v Vermont um, are meteorology places. And so these are places that we had students come from and work with our mentors. But this is also, from a researcher standpoint, shows you that we have the capability to allow for researchers across institutions to log into this environment and do their work together in a collaborative way. Again, working in the same framework with everyone's operating um, in the same version of Python or Guar and all the libraries are up to date as well. I'll add to, on to that, that uh, looking at software carpentry, another uh, struggle we had is when we kick off a session. So prior to this, we, we had the struggle of installing software and helping learners install this. And we wanted to minimize uh, their barrier of entry to this. So uh, we, we left it open. So they just needed to know what the URL was to get into our environment, log into it, and they would have access to, um, to that environment. So lowering that, that barrier of entry. So uh, this is a work in progress, and we are still learning, but we, we are leveraging the community to, um, to lessen some of that, that burden on us. Uh, another thing I wanna mention is during our pilot, uh, we have not uh, purchased any additional hardware. All of this is hardware that uh, the partners have, uh, have shared with us. And that has both pros and cons. So we don't own that hardware. So we've, we've learned some ways of troubleshooting uh, when something stops working. Um, and another thing we've done is, is reached out through the chat software and, and provided feedback. And we've, we've also provided um, areas where we discovered signals of, well, this node is down and shared that back with, uh, uh, with the Nautilus folks and uh, contributing to make their system even more robust. So the, the other ways that we can help in working with the researcher um, who used our AI module is now interested in using it in his own research. He's already gotten the VPR to purchase him some additional storage. So our job this summer will be to add that storage to the Kubernetes system so that he can access this. He will be limiting it to his own research group, which is one of the other things that you can do within this Nautilus system. You can carve out a little bit for yourself, but because he believes in this and he likes the fact that he's gonna be using other people's GPUs, he wants to share some of that. So a percentage about, I think you said about maybe 15, 20% of the storage he wants to put out into the general pool to share with the community. So the idea then again is this in this distributive system is that every institution has a way to maybe just contribute a little bit. Um, University of Oklahoma does this through a Fiona node that's associated with networking work that we do out of the High Performance Computing Center. That's contributing to the nodes um, for that. So um, the idea then is that, you know, as a shared resource, you can contribute what you can, you use what you want, just be a good user and be smart about it. Um, we have been sharing out this um, system that we've been using and um, it's worked out pretty, pretty good for us um, up to this point. So we're, we're finishing up our first phase uh, of our pilot and we're gonna start writing up some, some both internal and external documentation and look at kicking off our second phase uh, where we're gonna be looking more at sustainability and building partnerships uh, on our campus and again, strengthening our partnerships with the community. Um, Scaling um, in terms of library support, we, yeah. we don't necessarily want to be managing the day to day or when the network starts to go bad and people are having problems connecting. Uh, so that's not, we just don't have the time and the resources to do that. Um, that would actually probably be a better job for our central IT to maybe weigh in on. We would like to be working with the faculty members um, on, 
on container development and library management for whatever they're trying to do within the common framework on this. We want to expand beyond just meteorology. Um, I'm excited that we have a potential to have a digital humanities course. It is, is what I refer to as my programming uh, classicist. He's a Latin professor who taught, self-taught in Python, digital humanities. He's teaching a digital humanities course this fall, and um, he's looking at using this framework. He is a good example of where a lot of the students are coming in on Chromebooks. So this is, this is one of these things where I think the library is starting to also realize about this equity of computing. Not every group on campus that you may support from a research or training and educational standpoint has access to high performance type of computing or just even regular type of computing that would allow for you to run some of these tools. This now starts to, to leverage that and level the playing field, so to speak. It still requires a network connection. It doesn't have to be broadband. It just has to be stable. That's the only gotcha in this, in the, and that stability goes along for the rest of us. Um, yeah, Nautilus framework for researchers. We just successfully got our first AI running with GPUs. So again, we would like to see some of our containers be focused more on the needs of researchers. And we were, were very concerned about making sure that, that we have local partners that both can help us with some of the work, but also helping to promote this and work with us on that. I think we left a few minutes for questions, maybe not. We're <laughs> 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 done. Uh, put a fork in it. <laughs> Just go ahead. Yeah, there is some ways that you can have shared storage that, that, that the, the people who log in will have that common shared storage within their accounts allows for that type of collaboration. So any code that you might have on, in, in that's in that shared space, as it stands, it, as when a person logs in, that's private. So that does not get shared out, but there are configurations that do allow for that sharing and creating those environments. We have just not learned yet how to do that for ourselves. I know there's some groups there's that some groups Nautilus has helped We'll be going sharing. to the GitLab repository and stealing their YAML files. Yeah. I mean, that's really what it comes down to because everyone in this community shares their stuff. It's, it's not that hard to reconstruct. Um, we're, we have the advantage, and I'm gonna take care of the expert bias. Um, I'm, I'm a former systems operator and in installing software and things like that. Um, Tyler is an informaticist and is very much familiar with working with APIs, but YAML especially, so we do have a little bit of an advantage there. But our resources were available. Um, we partnered with uh, libraries at the University of Kansas where they were teaching a um, library course on um, text recognition. OC, OC, using OC, Tesseract. But using Tesseract. Yep. And that is a real beast to install if, if you're familiar with that coming from the libraries. And this allowed for a workshop of 25 um, librarians from 25 different institutions to all work in the same common environment and have that workshop be successful. We're working on that. It's, um, the, there's been starts and stops and whatever. Um, as a library and within our own offering of researcher support services, digital humanities is always on our mind. Um, I may be classically trained in meteorology, but I was a music not wannabe. And, and my favorite courses from college weren't my science classes, but my humanities classes. So there's an affinity for us just as individuals to not forget the humanities on this, but it, it, to me, and I'm very much of the ilk that you raise the tide of the whole ship. And so these are resources. And as the digital ham, humanists, humanists start to realize some of these tools have, have some purpose with what they do, there's groups on campus that have been using these tools. I'm hoping to start to foster that type of, of collaboration so that people can learn from each other on that. But for us, we do have a, a digital, digital humanities tilt into the library. We do have a section that does that. It's, we're, we're hiring, um, <laughs> I'll put out that much. Um, so it's always been part of this. I mean, our researcher services is about the technologies and tools, not the domains. 
because these tools really do cross numerous, numerous of these, of these domains. Go ahead. Yeah, we, we've thought about a couple of ideas, and our first go around was looking at cloud services, and we dropped that pretty quickly, but that sounds very interesting. Open grid, um, we, we, weren't, we were concerned a little bit about the, the, the NSF thing on science, and we knew we wanted to be able to expand this to the digital humanities, and so we weren't clear if we would be able to get access to the allocations for that. Um, working with this in this framework because we are approaching it from the instructional standpoint around a common framework. It becomes a little bit domain agnostic and we're not worried about it if it's being used for science versus everything else on that. Um, in terms of some of the stuff that we've done with the supercomputing around digital humanities, it's data. And data doesn't have boundaries either. So we kind of get around that NSF requirement that it's moving science forward. And that's the issue really with the, with the science grid. It, yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's uh, time. Any, maybe one more question. Nope. All right, thank you. Thank you.